In this lecture, we're going to talk about birth and death processes. These are ominously named, um, and they're, they're really similar to Poisson processes in that they count things, but they're different in that they count both up and down. Um, when they count up, we call that a birth event, and when they count down, we call that a death event. And there are special cases uh, that get special names. You can see some of the special cases, the, the conditions for the special cases over here on my left, and the names that we give those special cases over here on the right, also all ominous names. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's birth and death processes. We're, gonna, we're going to define them, and then we're going to focus in on trying to identify or calculate their uh, limiting distributions or stationary distributions or long-term distributions, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're going to work out a proof for what those are. And th these are then going to turn into a really useful tool for us as we move forward in our next lecture on queuing systems. All right, let's go. So today is all about birth and death processes, which is a sort of ominous sounding name. Um, uh, but really what we're trying to do is make some sort of process uh, that counts both up and down. So this is a lot like the Poisson process uh, lecture, except we're trying to count things that can, can go either up or down. Um, so how are we going to describe these? So these are going to be Markov processes, or just give like a sort of an informal discussion of what they are, and then we'll make a formal definition. So these are going to be a Markov process, um, so we'll use the same notation that we used before. We'll call it x of t, uh, and t is always going to be greater than or equal to zero. It's a real number. So it's a continuous time Markov chain. Um, and we're going to have x of t be some sort of a population. A population... So it's a discrete state, state space um, at time t. All right, so that's, that's just the sort of notation, the usual notation we're going to use. And uh, I just want to sort of mention again, so this is similar to a Poisson process. But uh, you can have events that trigger uh, counts that go up or counts that go down, uh, but with counting going up or down. I should, I guess, we should say up and down. All right, um, so the idea is uh, if something is going up, we call that a birth event, right? So a birth event. Means that X goes to X plus one. And a death event is a reduction of the population. By one. So, in a way, this is a lot. Actually, it is like the Poisson process, of course, uh, with up and down counting. But it's also a lot like the the random walk, uh, but it, with continuous time. Uh, so it's sort of a continuous time random walk. Uh, matches a lot uh, our problems that we saw before uh, in, in the random walk uh, section, um, but there's there's sort of uh, and there's there's a difference um, from the Poisson process that the the rates at which you count up or down 
should have some dependence on x itself, right? So the rates for births or deaths uh, should depend on x or could. Uh, Uh, so if you think about what does that mean, uh, if you have a population, the rate at which you grow, uh, the number of people uh, that that are produced per per unit time should be larger if the population is really big, um, or smaller if the population is really small. Um, so that's all we're trying to say here: births and deaths, both more frequent. for larger populations. All right, so let's dig into the formal definition. Uh, so we'll say that a birth and death process is a Markov process so just stop for a second. This is a little bit different than when we defined the Poisson process, which we just started off by saying it's some sort of process. Um, here we're saying it's a Markov process. Um, X of t, t greater than or equal to zero, um, taking on non-negative integer values. Um, and it obeys the following four properties, right? So here they go. Property number one. Each of these looks kind of the same, and so we'll copy the statement over and over again and just change kind of uh, the, the details. So property number one says that the probability that x at time t plus h is equal to n plus 1 given that x of t was equal to n. All right, so that's that's a birth event. Um, this is equal to lambda sub n times h plus little o h as h goes to zero. So we're using the same type of, if you remember, this is a, this little o notation means that, um, so let's, let's just write it explicitly here. Right, so something, this, this thing means this is, little o of h is something that falls off faster than h. as h approaches 0. All right, so we introduced this notation in the last lecture. So basically, we're, we're using uh, a definition that's similar to the third part of the third definition of Poisson processes. Okay, so that's the description of a birth event, and it defines the birth rate. So let, let's try to define uh, the other things uh, with a similar statement. So actually, let's just do this. So we'll say property two. So that first one is for a birth event, and property two is going to be for a death event. And the death event is the same. Uh, it's an increment by one, but instead of going up by one, you go down by one. And the rate isn't necessarily the same. It's not lambda. Uh, so we allow it to be something different, and we'll call it mu sub n. And it's important to remember that there's an n on here. The rates can change uh, depending on time. 
All right, so that's that's a death event. Um, and now we'll make uh, the remaining two. So x at t plus h, if you're given that you were at n at x of t, you can either go up one, down one, or you can actually stay the same, and that's it. That's the only three possibilities. Um, so the third event that we want to describe here is when you don't change at all. And so we've erased that thing there. And now the left-hand side is a bit different. The birth and death rates are already defined. And so the probability of this happening is the complement of the probability of either a birth or a death. Right, so how do I want to write this? Um, I better just erase this whole side here and write it out it's from scratch. So it's 1 minus lambda n plus mu n times h. All right, and then we have the same thing. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have enough room there, so I'll write plus o h as h goes to 0. All right, so that's the, the third possibility. And then the fourth is just anything else uh, is has a probability of 0. All right, so let's do that. So the fourth, rule, fourth part of the definition for this process is to say that the probability of any other change so we'll say this is you go from x of t equals n to x of t plus h is n plus something we'll say n plus j uh, this is going to be equal to zero or actually, we'll just say O H little O H also as H goes to zero. And this is uh, for J having magnitude bigger than one. All right, and so these these parameters that we've just introduced uh, lambda n and mu sub n, we call those, uh, so first of all, they're positive. They're greater than zero. Uh, we, su we say that those are the birth and death rates. Respectively. So lambda n are the birth rates and mu sub n are the death rates. So our plan is to work out the stationary distribution of these processes, so how they behave over long times. Um, but before we do that, it's, it's good to kind of classify the processes for uh, when they obey certain conditions, uh, when, when the rates uh, obey certain kind of special conditions. So we'll call these special cases. And these are, we're just going to name these special cases. Um, so let's say, suppose that you can say a rule for all n for the rates. All right, so we'll say if for all n, and then we'll say what the rule is or the condition, um, and then we'll say the name. All right, so. Uh, the first of these rule or conditions or rules is suppose that the rule is that lambda n is always zero, right? So that means um, there's never any birth. You can't have any counting up. It's all counting down. So this is called pure death. bit of an ominous name. I don't know why they don't just call it counting down, but this is the name that people use for it. Um, if lambda n is 0, but also mu sub n is proportional 
to n, uh, this is called linear pure death. Right, so it's still only counting down, but the rate at which you count down actually increases with n. Um, all right, so that's one of the other names there. Um, if mu sub n is zero, this is called pure birth. You can only count up. And if mu sub n is zero and lambda sub n, or sorry, yeah, and lambda sub n is proportional to n, this is called linear pure birth. Um, and the last one is if mu, so this is sort of a very special, super special case, but you, it might, you might be interested to kind of see how you can get it. Um, this is just to show you how you get a Poisson process out of this. Uh, so to make a Poisson process, you're not allowed to count down. Um, and what's the other condition? Um, if you think about it, actually there's two. So mu sub n is zero, lambda sub n is a constant, and there's one other condition, x of zero is zero. All right, so if, th if these are the conditions, you get back the Poisson process. All right, so we want to work out the stationary distribution of uh, birth and death processes. That's the idea. But in order to do so, we're going to use uh, a certain uh, equation or set of equations called the forward Kolmogorov equations. Um, and so let's let's just define those for, well, I don't know if this, you could, you could think of this as a definition, but we're, it's a proposition and we're going to prove it. Um, so this is proposition and it's the Kolmogorov forward equations. All right, now we want to be able to describe the stationary distribution, so we better say what that really means, or what at least the uh, state occupation distribution vector even looks like. So we'll say for a birth and death process, because we haven't really talked about those yet for Markov processes. X of t t greater than or equal to zero. Um, we'll call the stationary or the state occupation distribution u of t as a vector. So if u of t is the state occupation distribution vector at time t. state occupation distribution vector or just the state vector or just the I don't know the different names for this um, at time t um, then what that means is that u sub n at time t is equal to the probability that x of t is equal to n. Right, and so for this we can have n as the usual, any of the states, 0, 1, 2, and so on. All right, this is, this is actually, a, we should have had this before, I guess, as a definition, uh, if you want it to be a definition. It's actually not really different from what we used in the case of a Markov chain. Uh, but anyway, so so that's the setup for what the uh, state occupation distribution vectors are, and then we're going to write down the the Kolmogorov forward equations, and so they are the following. So then, here are those equations. So we say that it and it's a it's it's a differential equation. We we'll say that the derivative with respect to time of u sub n as a function of t. So that's the thing that we're interested in. 
Um, and this thing is going to have, it's, it's going to be described basically in, 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 with two different equations. Essentially, there's a special one for when n is zero, because we want to talk about the three different sort of scenarios, incrementing up, incrementing down, or not incrementing at all. And you're sort of restricted uh, by what you can do when you're actually at n equals zero. So anyways, so let's just write the general kind of all the time one at the top. So we'll say this is lambda n minus one times u sub n minus one at t. So that's the first term. And then minus lambda n plus mu n u sub n of t plus mu sub n u sub n plus 1. Sorry, I've got this a bit wrong. It's mu sub n plus 1 u sub n plus 1 at time t. All right, so that's the that's what the equation looks like uh, for n greater than 1. Put this over here like this. It's kind of big. So this is for n greater than 1, or greater than or equal to 1, sorry, n greater than 0. If n is equal to 0, uh, you get a sort of a special case, and that's minus lambda 0, u sub 0 of t plus mu sub 1 u sub 1 of t. And so that's for n equals 0. The proof of this is pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll do, we'll only prove the n greater than or equal to 1 case. That's the harder one. Uh, the other one is easier, but it's a little specialized. All right, so the idea is just to uh, make use of the definition. All right, so uh, we're going to write out, uh, well, uh, there's sort of two steps to this. We're going to look at uh, the distribution vector at some time plus h. Um, and, then, and then we're going to work it out using the definition. And then we're going to form the derivative of u uh, in the usual way by taking the difference from time t compared to t plus h and divide by h and then take the limit that h goes to zero. And then we'll use all those little o things uh, to make the the definition work out as or make things work out as we as we want i mean well they'll come out the way we want <laughs> all right so the idea is so you at for state n at time t plus h right so this is equal to the probability that x at time t plus h is equal to n right and there's uh, three ways you could get there. Uh, you could either step up to it, step down to it, or stay at it. Um, those are the only three ways. And so you, you can write this, uh, you can expand this with the total probability theorem. It's a sum over j equaling zero to really to infinity. But a bunch of these are going to go away. Um, of the probability that x of t plus h, oops, is equal to n given that x of t is equal to j times the probability that x is, of t is equal to j. And if you look back at our definition, so let's look, scroll back here and look. There's only three of these possibilities, uh, so you can only you can only increment uh, up, down, stay the same, and that's it. Any 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 further uh, any larger incrementations uh, away from the state n have a probability of well, it's really O H, right? Uh, but it's going to be zero in the end, um, and so. What we have here is only really three terms. Uh, so we've got the probability 
that x of t plus h is equal to n given x of t was equal to n minus 1. So this is just expanding the sum times the probability that x of t is equal to, oh, well, I should say, so this is the same for all of these guys, so, so, so this guy here, right, is this, this guy is u sub j. Right, um, and so here, so here what we have is u sub n minus 1 at time t. So that's the first time, type of thing. So that's if you uh, stepped up, right? Um, and then probability that x of t plus h is equal to n given that x of t was equal to n. So this is where you, you don't change at all. So that's times u sub n of t. And then lastly, the probability x of t plus h is equal to n given that x of t was n plus 1. And so then times u sub n plus 1 at time t. All right? Now, there's a, in principle, there's a bunch of other terms in that sum. Uh, so you could write it like this, plus the sum. Uh, let's, let's steal. Um, let's do this. Might get some of that in there. I'll, I'll delete it. So the remaining things look like this. except that the ma magnitude of j is bigger than 1, or bigger than, yeah, bigger than 1. And all those are zero, all those uh, have probability, uh, the, the first term is 0. Or really it's OH, uh, so maybe we should keep track of that. Uh, it's OH um, as H goes to 0. I always end up making that zero look like an O, or a little O. Okay, uh, so now we can we can tidy this up by putting in our values for the probabilities and stuff, right? And so uh, basically, I'm using the rules that we have in the definition for like what is this guy? What is this guy? What is this guy? Much the same way that I just used a rule to eliminate or almost eliminate all of those, right? Okay, let's let's give ourselves. Not, not so much room. All right, so the first term, the probability of, of uh, stepping down, right? If you go back to the definition, look what that is. This is h times lambda n minus 1 and then u sub n minus 1 of t. So that's that first term. And then the second term, this guy is when you, when you, uh, don't step at all, all right? So we said that's 1 minus h lambda sub n plus mu sub n times u of n, or u sub n of t. Um, and then there's the, the stepping, uh, which, which way, up, down? I'm getting a little bit tangled up, but the last one looks like this. Uh, it's h times mu sub n plus 1, um, u sub n plus 1 at time t, right? And then all of those are plus something of little o h as h goes to 0. Right, okay. Now, all we do now is just write the definition of the derivative using this expression. All right, so now what we're going to do is move u sub n at time t to the left-hand side. All right, so where's that term? It's over here, this guy here. 
right? So move that guy over to the left, and uh, for basically we form the derivative. Okay, so let's just blah blah blah. Let's just form the derivative. Okay, and so what we were trying to get at is u sub n t plus h minus u sub n t divided by h. Right, so we want to form this. And what we get is lambda sub n minus 1. So you should be able to see this from up here. U sub n minus 1 of t. Right, that's the first thing. Minus lambda sub n plus mu sub n. U sub n of t. Um, plus mu sub n plus 1 u sub n plus 1 at t uh, and plus little o h divided by h. Okay, now we take the limit to make the derivative. And we make use of the little o h property, right? And so what we get is the result, the expected result, the derivative of u sub n at t, right? So we'll look at look at what happens here. When we take the limit, uh, the h over here is the only place where it appears. The left hand side it makes the derivative. Um, on the right hand side, this term is going to become zero because o h little o h goes to zero faster than h as h approaches zero. That's the whole point. Right, and so we've got the expected result. Um, I guess I can just copy it over and get rid of the little oh. Okay, and so that that's what we were hoping to see, um, and we'll leave it to you to do the n equals zero case. All right, and that's our proof. All right, so we're now ready to see the limiting distributions for these birth and death processes. And we're going to do it in the usual uh, traditional math way of showing you the answer and then proving it. Um, so we'll write the answer as a proposition. And uh, so what we're looking for, so we have a birth and death process. BD process, let's call it that. Um, and we'll, we'll give him the same notation that we've been doing all along. Um, so this thing, what we're trying to find, uh, so we'll say the limiting distribution, so limiting means t going to infinity. You can always let t go to infinity, but it might not be that you then settle on some particular distribu distribution. That's that's why we say uh, what we want to talk about is whether or not this exists. So we say the limiting or otherwise called equilibrium distribution so we call it by a bunch of different names. Stationary sometimes it's called. I think we've called it that, the stationary distribution. Um, it exists, uh, well, so first of all, let's just write what it is. So it's pi sub n. Uh, so it's a vector pi. Uh, and the nth uh, component of that vector is the limit that t goes to infinity. The probability that x of t, oops, that x of t is equal to n. Uh, so this thing exists uh, if and only if uh, 
uh, the cer- a certain condition it holds, and the, the condition is this, this number that we're about to write down, which has kind of a long formula. Uh, this number has to be finite. Um, and so the number we're going to call it R, capital R, just what statisticians need, another thing called capital R. Um, this is a sum. There's a lot of different ways to write this. Um, N equals 1 to infinity. Um, I'm going to just define this term here. We'll call this R sub N, right? So that's what that sum looks like. Um, and then I'll define R sub N with this next line. Right? Um, and so it's N equals 1 to infinity, and here's R sub N. It's a ratio, which you could define with a product, but symbols are kind of getting a little, comp- like, too many here, so I want to just be explicit. Uh, so this is lambda n minus 1 times lambda n minus 2, um, and so on, until you get down to lambda 0. So that's the numerator. And the denominator is mu, and then it starts at n times mu n minus 1. And then that continues until you get down to mu sub 1. Right? So this thing has to be finite. So this has to be less than infinity uh, in order for the limiting distribution to exist. And if it does, um, and so if, and if this is true, and we say it's given by, it's given by the following expression. So it's a two, it's a piecewise thing. There's again a special case when n is equal to zero. So the state n equals zero is a funny one because it's it's up against the end. Um, so we have pi sub n is equal to um, the n equals 0 case is simpler. It's 1 plus r, where r is the thing defined above, to the minus 1. Right? And if you wanted to, you, you could just write here. That's So that's pi 0. And so this is, this is for n equals 0. Um, and then if it's, if n is not zero, it looks like this. So it's r sub n times one plus r to the minus one. So in other words, it's r sub n times pi zero. And that's for n not equal to zero. So this is what the distribution actually looks like. You can, there's another, another way, I mean, if you're not bored of them already, there's another way you could write this as a single thing using a Kronecker delta function. So you can write this as different expression, but I mean, same result, but simpler in a way. You can write this as the following, say pi sub n is equal to r sub n plus Kronecker delta n zero, one minus r sub n, all divided by one plus r. Or in other words, pi zero times r sub n plus delta n zero. 1 minus r sub n. You don't have to use those at all. Uh, I just thought you might want to see them. I find it sometimes nice if you to eliminate piecewise statements in terms of something that has a chronic or delta. I don't know why I like that. Um, yeah, so that's the proposition. All right, so let's try out a proof here. So the first thing to realize is, so we're going to use the, the forward Kolmogorov equations. That was the whole purpose for, for our introducing them today. Uh, so we're going to, for now, let's suppose that the equilibrium does exist, right? So suppose that equilibrium exists. Right? Then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Kolmogorov equations, and those give the derivative of u, right? So let's see, what, what do we want to say here? Um, if, if 
if the limiting uh, distribution exists, what we have is the following. Then this guy I guess we can put an N underneath there. This guy is equal to pi N, right? That's the whole idea. Now, the whole notion of the limiting distribution is that it's stable, right? And so it must be the case that uh, the derivative of this is zero. Right? So what we want to do is set the derivative u prime uh, sub n, which is our forward Kolmogorov equation, equal to zero. All right, so let's go back and look at those expressions. Way back here, here we go. So there's the derivative. So I guess I'll just steal the whole thing now and I'll take it apart down there. Okay, so let's paste it here, kind of maybe down a little bit, and then I'll, I'll take it, I'll, I'll kind of dissect it here. All right, so this must mean we've got two conditions, right? The n equals zero case, and the n greater than or equal to one case. Um, actually, let's just first take, I took too much here. Let's just, let's just deal with this guy. So this derivative for n equals zero looks like that. So it must be that this thing is equal to zero. So let me, let's just do this, here we go. <laughs> must be the case that zero is equal to both of these things. Let's just do that, okay? Um, from the Kolmogorov forward equation. Um, and so, okay, so for n equals zero, uh, what do we have? All right, we've got lambda zero, u zero of t, is equal to, oh, well, I guess I should put in pi's, right? Lambda zero pi zero is equal to mu one pi one, right? In other words, pi one is equal to lambda zero over mu one times pi zero. And that, that has the right form, right? That's the form we were looking for. Let's go back here and see the theorem, right? So lambda one, uh, that should be this guy for down here, right? R sub n, so what should we, R sub n times pi zero, where R sub n is this thing here, right? So for n equals one, that's, uh, just lambda zero divided by mu one. And then we want to multiply that by pi zero. I hope that was clear. You should pause it and look back at your notes to make sure you see that that's right. Um, and so that, 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 that works. Pi one works. Uh, we didn't say anything about whether or not pi zero uh, is in the right form, but we do see that pi one is of the right form. Um, and now we can uh, increment a little bit. Uh, so we say then, use, what do I want to take? Um, this guy. So I don't know, maybe I'll call this like star. I don't know. Well, let's just say the following. We'll say then n equals one in the Kolmogorov forward equation. Or well, let's just say in the above. <laughs> All right, so what do we have? So we have zero is equal to uh, lambda zero, u, uh, pi zero minus lambda one plus mu one times pi one plus mu two, u two, and that's it, right? Uh, so we can rearrange this a little bit, and what we get is zero 
is equal to, I don't need to write the zero again, I guess. This is pi zero. I'm gonna sort of tidy things up, I guess, a little bit. So the idea is I want to make use of this and put that there. So there's going to be a common factor of pi zero for both this term and this term. And so what I'll get is pi zero times lambda zero minus the quantity or minus here's pi one lambda zero over mu one times the quantity lambda one plus mu one, right? Plus mu two, pi two. Oops, I should have put pi up here, like that, all right? Now, so if we solve this for pi two, what we get is the correct form. So pi two is equal to pi zero over mu two, lambda zero over mu one times lambda one plus mu one minus lambda zero. All right, and this is equal to lambda zero over mu two, just factoring out the lambda zero, lambda one over mu one plus one, and then minus one. And so this is equal to the expected form, lambda one, lambda zero over mu two, mu one, pi zero. Okay, so you could keep ratcheting up. Uh, you could keep incrementing this up. So go to n equals two, uh, get an expression for pi three. So, so this has the right form. Uh, you could keep on going, or you could go by induction. So either continue or use induction. to find the form pi n is equal to um, lambda n minus one, lambda n minus two, all the way down to lambda zero. And then underneath we've got mu n, mu n minus one, mu zero. And that's, uh, sorry, times pi zero which we still haven't dealt with. And that's the expected form, right? That's the Rn, R sub n times pi zero. All right, so you can do that either by induction or just keep repeating yourself um, and develop that. Um, and then, so we deal with pi zero with the honesty condition, right? So honesty condition And the honesty condition says that all the pi's have to add up to one, right? Uh, and so this guy is one is equal to the sum of n equals zero to infinity of pi n. And so if you write that out, so that's pi zero plus pi zero times the sum of n equals one to infinity of r sub n. And that quantity we had nicknamed r. 
So this is pi zero times one plus r, right? And therefore, oops, let me make that pi zero look a little bit more respectable. And so we've got pi zero is equal to one plus r to the minus one, which is the correct form for pi zero. So we've got all of them in the correct form. Now there's only one thing that remains, uh, which is that we said suppose that uh, the stationary uh, distribution exists. And so it should be the case, uh, if our proof is correct, that this, this then implies that R is finite. Um, and that follows right away because, so uh, it must also be, so then notice, Um, it has to be the case that R is in is is in is finite. <laughs> Hang on. You must have all right. R is going to be bigger than zero, uh, or or equal to zero, anyways. But it 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 can't be infinite. Because if it were, right, so suppose that this were violated and, and r were to be infinite, then this would be infinite. And so, so what would happen? You'd have pi 0 would go to 0. And if you had that, since pi 0 multiplies everything here, then all the pi's would go to 0. Uh, which would definitely violate the honesty condition, um, and it's just sort of a pathological situation. All right, that's the proof. Okay, I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, we've got our birth and death process all sorted out now, and we're ready to dive into queuing systems in our next chapter, or our next lecture. I'll see you then.